Ma'am, ma'am, calm down. How can I help you? Please, please help. My friend is dead. I saw her killer. He chased me here. She was a young, ambitious, licensed vocational nurse on her journey to becoming a registered nurse. She shared her life and dreams with her devoted boyfriend, a newcomer from Haiti who was struggling to find his footing in American culture. He was deeply indebted to her boundless generosity as the primary breadwinner, purchasing most everything in her name, even their big, beautiful Palmdale, California home. But their picturesque life abruptly ended when a heinous act destroyed everything they held dear. She was dragged across the carpet. The garage floor was smeared with blood. Her car parked inside with its trunk eerily open. Nearby, a gray pitcher, stained with a bloody fingerprint suspected to be the murderer's, sat next to her body. A chilling, heartless note was left on the kitchen floor. Her best friend, Lorene, discovered her body, wrapped in garbage bags on the garage floor, in a pool of blood, lifeless. The mystery puzzled everyone who witnessed the horrific scene, leaving them wondering, who could have done this to Linnell? Did Linnell know her killer? Is it possible that her romantic relationship had taken a fatal turn? Or was a more ominous force at play here? Linnell had been victimized so much throughout her life, she had been stalked, run off the road, causing her car to crash. Her privacy had been invaded. Her phone calls, emails, and text messages got into the wrong hands. Her identity had been stolen, and now she had been murdered. Just like Linnell, our digital footprints leave a wealth of personal information accessible online, making each of us a potential target for those seeking to uncover details about our lives. This reality hits close to home for me especially since my video research frequently involves gathering information about individuals online. But if our personal information gets into the wrong hands, it can turn our lives upside down. When both my mom and husband had their identities stolen, it was a wake-up call for me. Every year now, we have to use a special security pin just to file our taxes. And when I did a little digging on my own information, I was shocked at how much detail was out there. Past and present phone numbers, addresses, email addresses, and even the names of my family members popped up with searches on my name alone. It was alarming. It's all out there for anyone who wants to know. And companies called data brokers are benefiting from it. They're in the business of selling those personal details, from your full name, email address, and home address, to sensitive health records, and even information about your relatives. This information isn't just sitting out there. It's actively being sold to scammers, spammers, telemarketers, robocallers, and anyone looking to target you. That's precisely why I've turned to Aura, our sponsor for today's video. Aura doesn't just reveal which data brokers have my information up for grabs. It actively steps in to safeguard my privacy by automatically sending opt-out requests to telemarketers and data brokers on my behalf. Aura uncovered 18 data brokers that were actively selling my personal information and alerted me that one of my email addresses was found on the dark web. They also gave me valuable tips on how to avoid emails phishing for more information about me. Cleaning up my information in this way not only helps to reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use my information to help them access my social media accounts, banking accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that we don't even know are out there. With Aura, I enjoy a suite of features like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more, all without the hassle of juggling multiple apps. It's a breeze to set up, and the cherry on top? I get all these perks bundled together at a price that doesn't break the bank. You might already be using a couple of the security tools I just mentioned, but Aura brings it all together into one solution, and Aura operates around the clock. It's always on doing the hard work of keeping you safe so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. Sign up through my link right now at aura.com slash sleuthylucy, and Aura will give you a two-week free trial. But I have to tell you, prepare to be stunned by how much of your private information Aura finds exposed. 
For a more direct route, you can simply click the link in the description below. Now let's get back to the video. June 16th, 2010. It was about 7.30 p.m. in Palmdale, California, when Lorraine Austin burst into the sheriff's station in a panic, her clothing, hands, and feet smeared with blood. She reported a gruesome discovery. Her friend, Linnell Barsock, had been brutally murdered. Loreen said she found Linnell's body in a garage, surrounded by a pool of blood. The situation escalated when she encountered a man wielding a gun at the top of the stairs inside Linnell's home. Fearing for her life, she fled towards the safety of the police station, the armed man in pursuit. Miraculously, she managed to lose him as she neared the station, where she now recounts the distressing events to the deputies. Following her initial report, Loreen was taken to an interview room for a more detailed interrogation. There, Loreen told detectives that she planned to finish her friend's hair weave and that she arrived at Linnell's place around 10 this morning. Shortly after getting there, Louis, Linnell's boyfriend, left for Loreen's boyfriend's house in L.A. to get help with fixing his truck. As Loreen detailed her day to the detectives, she mentioned that while doing Linnell's hair, they ended up talking about a secret cell phone Linnell couldn't seem to locate. As it would turn out, Linnell couldn't find the phone because Lewis had taken it, believing it was out of service. However, during his trip to LA, Lewis discovered the phone was still operational. Someone had added minutes to it, enabling Linnell to keep in touch with another man she was seeing, Ike. Ike had given Linnell the phone specifically for their private conversations, away from Lewis's prying eyes. Now knowing that the phone was still active, Lewis rushed back home to confront Linnell with the evidence, questioning her with a mix of disbelief and anger. Why is this phone still on? You told me you were going to end it and turn it off, Lewis said. Lorene recounted a heated exchange where Linnell grabbed the phone back from Lewis. After this intense encounter, she and Linnell decided to leave the house, heading to a nearby beauty supply store to pick up some hair products. Loreen said that Lewis was unable to let the matter of the secret phone go. He followed them, intent on continuing the argument over the secret phone. He was visibly upset. She said the argument seemed to subside when Linnell handed the phone back to Lewis outside the beauty supply store. This act appeared to calm Lewis, prompting him to go back home. Lorene told detectives that after that, she and Linnell picked up a pre-ordered pizza from Jasinski's and soft drinks from Tom's Burger, returning home around 12.30 p.m. Lorene told detectives that tensions flared again. She said they had been arguing the entire week leading up to Linnell's tragic murder. Then, after an hour of heated exchange, Lorene decided to leave to give them time to talk privately. Lewis found out about I her and Lewis got into a fight Monday. This like, past Monday. This Monday, yeah. He was in her face and he was like something three days ago. Yeah. That if she was cheating it session scratch. I left so big as hawk. I told her I said, look, y'all have some issues and y'all need to talk and I don't want to be here. She said it was around 1 30 PM when she walked to a nearby park spending a few hours there before returning around 6.30 p.m. to a horrific discovery. Linnell, her best friend, dead. Lorene said when she returned to the house, there was an eerie silence that greeted her. Unable to locate her friend inside, she went to the garage to check for her friend's car, navigating the space barefoot. Suddenly, she slipped on something slick. And then I turned around, it was like plastic bags, and I like slid on the bags. Then turning to identify the cause, she was horrified to find herself amidst plastic bags, slick with wetness. I'm looking at the blood, and then when I looked, I saw her legs. As her eyes adjusted to turning the light on, a ghastly sight materialized before her. Blood was everywhere. I walked around the corner, she had a bag over her head, and I'm sitting there like, oh my gosh. She said she looked beneath the bags after noticing human legs and feet painted with nail polish peering out from them. The pedicure was unmistakably her friend's, so Lorene felt her ankle for a pulse, but there was none. She uncovered her friend's face and confirmed her worst fears. I ran over there and I picked her up. Linnell had been murdered. 
In shock, she returned inside, only to freeze at the sound of a noise. Glancing upward, she locked eyes with a man at the top of the stairs, brandishing a gun. Driven by pure instinct, she fled, fearing she would be the next victim. Loreen said she made a beeline for her car, escaping just in time. While driving, she glanced in her rearview mirror and noticed he was chasing her. Frantically, she reached for her phone to dial 911, and finding it missing, she drove directly to the police station. But thankfully, she managed to elude him as she approached the safety of the station. The officers conducting the interview thoroughly recorded Lorene's detailed account and proceeded to photograph her, carefully documenting the bloodstains on her clothing, hands, and feet to preserve as critical evidence. According to Lorene, this was a day she expected to be routine, but tragically ended with her discovering her friend, Linnell, dead on the floor. In the summer of 2010, Linnell Barsak was living her dreams. She was doing very well for herself. At the age of 29, she was the proud owner of a BMW. Her financial stability and ability to indulge in luxury were the fruits of her dedication and hard work as a licensed vocational nurse at a nearby care center. And she was well respected for her compassion and giving nature at her workplace. Growing up in South Los Angeles, Linnell was known for her radiant, bubbly personality and ceaseless smile. She was the third of five siblings. Her friends would say that she embodied ambition and hard work, especially as she navigated through nursing school. It was there where she crossed paths with Marcel Fomatar, a recent immigrant from Cameroon both of them pursuing pre-nursing courses with dreams of becoming registered nurses. Linnell became a guiding light for Marcel, generously helping him to adjust to the nuances of American life. To him, she was more than a friend. She was a mentor, lending him textbooks and often invaluable advice. One of Linnell's most heartwarming gestures was when she invited Marcel to shop for sneakers under the guise of buying a gift for her boyfriend, Louis. In a delightful twist, Marcel was unaware that Linnell was actually selecting three pairs of sneakers as a birthday surprise for him. The gesture was made even more special by Linnell's subtlety. She never explicitly mentioned they were a birthday present, allowing Marcel the joy of discovering it himself. This gesture was a testament to Linnell's quiet, thoughtful and generous spirit, characteristics that Marcel deeply admired, leading him to affectionately consider her as his guardian angel in America. But Marcel wasn't the only recipient of Linnell's giving nature. Louis Bonheur, originally from Haiti, had been in the U.S. for just a year when he crossed paths with Linnell. They met while Louis was taking ESL classes at the same institution where Linnell was studying for her RN qualification. A chance encounter at a bus stop after class, where Linnell offered Louis a ride home, marked the beginning of their deep connection. Their relationship quickly grew, filled with mutual affection, leading them to move in together. In just a year before her untimely death, Linnell had acquired a spacious six-bedroom house in Palmdale, which she was in the process of filling with upscale furniture and large screen TVs. This was the home she and Lewis shared. By this time, Lewis had secured a job in the maintenance department of the city of Hawthorne, while Linnell worked at a health center in LA, both carving out their paths in their new life together. Despite how well Linnell was doing financially, her personal life, however, was marked by complexities, notably her relationship with Lewis. Their relationship was characterized by its ups and downs, with Lewis's jealousy being a significant source of tension. Lewis was known for his hot temper, which reached a disturbing peak when he once stalked Linnell, aggressively forcing her car off the road and resulting in a car crash. This alarming behavior hinted at a deep-seated jealousy which, as events unfolded, appeared to have some basis. However, he was overly scrutinizing, often invading Linnell's privacy 
by checking her cell phone and text messages. He called and texted back unknown numbers while pretending to be her, just so he could see if it was another guy. He would even stake out around her workplace at lunchtime to verify her whereabouts, trying to catch her spending time with another man. Lewis was driven by suspicions of infidelity. In 2009, when Linnell and Lewis purchased their home, she was brimming with optimism for the future. It was her dream to transform her property into a board and care facility for the elderly. Her ideas provided a glimpse into her entrepreneurial mindset and her ambition to make a meaningful impact. Linnell seemed to have it all going for her. She had the looks, the financial stability, a beautiful home, a luxurious car, and even marriage appeared to be on the horizon. However, this idyllic picture began to fade over time. Her friends and family initially believed she was deeply in love with Lewis, but they noticed her affection gradually diminishing as the relationship became more tumultuous. Linnell confided in Marcel about the arguments they had and expressed a growing desire to end the relationship. She revealed to Marcel that their intimacy had ended and, in the days leading up to her tragic end, she voiced concerns over financial issues. Linnell was critical of Lewis's money management and was increasingly frustrated by his lack of ambition and seriousness about forging a career path for himself. Trouble was indeed brewing beneath the surface of what seemed like an ideal life, yet so many questions loomed. What transpired on that fateful Wednesday afternoon to bring such a devastating end to a woman whose life was dedicated to caring for others? What could have triggered such a violent response? Was this a case of murder fueled by jealousy? Meanwhile, back at the sheriff's station, Loreen has spent the last 30 minutes thoroughly recounting events of a traumatic day, crafting a detailed narrative of the chilling murder scene. Promptly after her initial report, sheriff's deputies were dispatched to the 37400 block of Rocky Lane in Palmdale, a mere 15 minutes away. At 8.15, officers arrived at Linnell's home. As they made their entrance, a heavy silence greeted them. The deputies cautiously entered, methodically checking each corner of the house, which appeared empty. Driven by a pressing urgency, they focused their search efforts to find Linnell, but their search ended in tragedy when they found her on the garage floor, lying face up in a pool of blood, with her head covered by a plastic bag. Sadly, she was pronounced dead at the scene. An hour later, at 9.15, the case was escalated to homicide detectives, who immediately mobilized to investigate the scene. Originating from Los Angeles, roughly one and a half hours away, they wouldn't reach Linnell's residence, now deemed a crime scene, until 11 p.m. Upon arrival, detectives were struck by the property's appearance. A spacious, well-appointed home about 3,400 square feet, situated in a nice Palmdale neighborhood. Notably, there was no evidence of forced entry, nor were there any items missing suggesting a familiar relationship between Linnell and her killer. Prompted by these observations, the detectives called for the forensics team to conduct a thorough examination of the scene. Navigating through the house, detectives found everything seemingly untouched, with many rooms still unfurnished, indicating no immediate signs of disturbance. However, the scene changed upon entering the laundry room. There, they encountered the unmistakable evidence of a crime. Bloody towels were strewn across the floor, while clean towels lay haphazardly atop the washer and dryer, suggesting a hurried attempt to manage the scene. The presence of blood on the floor was peculiar, not resembling spatter from a wound, but more like deliberate smears or wipes, as if an attempt had been made to clean up evidence. Two detectives, this detail suggested a calculated effort to conceal the crime. Progressing from the laundry room towards the garage, detectives encountered additional signs of the grim event. They found more bloody towels scattered on the concrete floor, the plastic sheeting that Lorene had mentioned slipping on, and trash bags 
filled with what seemed to be blood-stained bedding. Linnell's car was backed into the garage with its trunk wide open. Adjacent to the trunk, a tire was strategically placed, leading detectives to theorize it was used as an improvised ramp to facilitate moving Linnell's body into the trunk. Circling around the vehicle, detectives discovered Linnell's body, positioned with her head near the rear wheels and her feet pointing towards the front of the car. A black plastic bag was found covering her head, offering a chilling insight into the mindset of the perpetrator. Experience told the detectives that covering the victim's face could indicate a murderer's reluctance to see the victim's face or a desire to prevent the deceased from seeing them, suggesting a possible emotional connection or remorse from the assailant. Transitioning from the garage back into the home and moving from the living room to the family room, the detectives noticed something amiss, a conspicuous empty space on the floor. It appeared as if an area rug that should have been there was missing. This observation clicked when detectives recalled the carpet rolled up and packed into Linnell's car, seemingly tailored for this specific spot. Upon closer inspection and confirmation, detectives determined it matched perfectly. The coffee table, too, had been displaced from its usual spot, suggesting the rug had been deliberately rolled up and placed in Linnell's car as part of the crime scene's alteration. Around 1.30 a.m., the sergeants who had documented Lorene's statement earlier made their way to the crime scene to update the detectives. They conveyed that Lorene detailed the chilling moments after she found Linnell's body, recounting how she suddenly heard a noise upstairs following the sound of footsteps descending the stairs. It was at this instant she realized she wasn't alone. As the figure approached, she saw he was armed with a gun. Fearing for her life, she fled the premises. The sergeants told detectives that Lorene identified the man without hesitation. The person emerging from the shadows was none other than Linnell's live-in boyfriend of four years, Louis Bonner. Lorene pointed the finger squarely at Linnell's jealous, controlling, and possessive boyfriend as the potential culprit behind her death. Then what significantly intensified the detective's suspicion was a piece of evidence they had just discovered on the kitchen floor. A letter addressed to Lewis from Linnell. The letter revealed Linnell's intention to leave Lewis for Ike, urging him not to come looking for her. This letter, in light of Lewis's known jealousy, appeared to the detectives as the catalyst for the tragic events. It seemed to be the final straw that pushed Lewis to the brink, leading him to murder Linnell in a fit of jealous rage, unable to accept her departure for another man he had already suspected. Just over 10 hours had elapsed since the shocking discovery of Linnell's murder, and it was now the dawn of the following day at 6 a.m. Lorene, having spent the entire night at the sheriff's office, was now engaged in conversation with detectives. She emerged as an invaluable witness in the unfolding case. She shared with detectives that her friendship with Linnell dated back to their high school days in Los Angeles. Loreen, now living close to Linnell and Lewis, mentioned she frequented their home two to three times a week, giving her a front row seat to the couple's increasingly volatile arguments. Throughout the conversation, Loreen consistently referred to Linnell as Crystal, leading detectives to inquire about her preferred name. Does she go by Crystal or Linnell? I just call her by her middle name, Crystal. Loreen clarified that she always called her by her middle name, Crystal. Loreen said that the source of the tension stemmed from Lewis discovering Linnell's relationship with Ike, a man she had met just four months prior to her tragic end. Loreen said their connection sparked on Fleeing.com evolving into regular visits from Ike, who worked as a flight nurse in Sacramento. She said he made trips to visit Linnell in Palmdale on his days off when Lewis wasn't around. 
Lorene recounted a specific incident from a couple of months earlier, where an altercation escalated after Lewis overheard them on the phone, ultimately leading to the police being called. According to Lorene, this incident left unresolved tensions simmering between Linnell and Lewis. She said the week leading up to Linnell's death was marked by intense disputes, climaxing when Linnell and Lewis had a physical altercation on Monday, resulting in Linnell scratching Lewis. The discovery of a secret phone the following day, Tuesday, added fuel to the fire. Then, on the fateful Wednesday of Linnell's murder, Lorene highlighted yet another argument about Ike that occurred shortly before Linnell's tragic death. According to Lorene, Ike provided Linnell with this phone for secret communication. She said that arguments between Linnell and Lewis persisted despite Linnell's promise to end her relationship with Ike. Detectives identified Lorene as their most pivotal witness given her presence at the crime scene and her intimate knowledge of the events leading up to the tragedy. As the evidence mounting against Lewis became undeniable, their focus shifted to piecing together his movements and activities on that fateful Wednesday. This marked the beginning of a determined search for Lewis, but the search was swift and targeted. In the critical hours following Linnell's murder, even before her family was informed, detectives were able to quickly pinpoint his location. Surprisingly, he was found asleep at Linnell's mother's home in LA. So detectives made a strategic call to the house while en route, engaging Lewis in conversation. On the phone, he was remarkably cooperative, readily agreeing to meet the officers. Upon their arrival, Lewis emerged without resistance. He calmly walked outside and was escorted into the patrol car without incident. It was then, with Lewis securely in custody, that detectives broke the devastating news to Linnell's mother, Bobby, who was overcome with emotion. Then Lewis was transported to the police station for further questioning. Upon his arrival at the station, detectives quickly proceeded to photograph him and collect his DNA for analysis. Following these initial steps, they immediately dove into an intense interrogation, probing into the disappearance of his girlfriend, Linnell. Lewis claimed ignorance, stating that he had left their shared residence early in the morning at 10.30 a.m., a detail that aligned with Lorene's account. Lewis explained that after his errands, he opted to spend the night at Linnell's mother's house to avoid a lengthy commute to work the following morning. Having spent the entire day out and about in L.A., staying there seemed to be the practical choice due to its proximity to his workplace. When detectives delved into the nature of his relationship with Linnell, asking if it was a happy one, Lewis swiftly affirmed it was. However, upon further questioning about the state of their relationship, Lewis's response became more measured. Tell me you about your your relationship with your girlfriend. You guys happy? Yeah. Your relationship is good. I'm <laughs> you. I'm okay. With her. Is she okay with you? She's okay with me. She's been telling me she loves me all the time. Detectives were already aware of a previous police call to their residence over a domestic dispute, yet Lewis painted a picture of a harmonious relationship, insisting he and Linnell were deeply in love, denying any infidelity, and claiming everything between them was perfect. However, a noticeable scratch on Lewis's face caught the detective's attention, prompting them to probe further. Okay, got a question for you. You got a scratch on your face. Where did you get that? This one? Yeah, the one right across your cheek. Who scratched you? Oh, that was Linda last week. Lewis, touching the mark, responded as if downplaying its significance. But when pressed about who was responsible for the scratch, he admitted. He acknowledged an argument had taken place, but quickly tried to minimize its severity by attributing Linnell's actions to jealousy over his interactions with another woman on Facebook. This version, however, conflicted with Lorene's account, which pointed to Lewis, not Linnell, as the one consumed by jealousy. 
Then detectives asked about Ike. Who is this guy named Ike? Who is he? Okay. Ike? Ike. I can tell me Ike is his friend. Lewis told detectives that he was unaware of any romantic involvement between his girlfriend and Ike. Detectives were not gaining much ground, so they decided to confront him with that piece of evidence that they found on the kitchen floor in front of the refrigerator on their initial walkthrough of the house, an item they considered highly incriminating. This evidence was a breakup letter addressed to Lewis, signed by Linnell. It read, Dear Lewis, I'm leaving you for Ike. He makes more money, so you can do whatever you want to with the house. I'm moving out of state with Ike, so that's why I gave you that phone. We're getting married, so leave me alone. You can have everything in the house. I've been sleeping with him for four months now, and he's the only one that pay my car note. So good luck in life. P.S. I'm taking one of the TV. Goodbye, Linnell. But Lewis claimed he never saw that letter. He said he didn't know anything about it. Well, they did. I'm not talking about the little letter who's telling you she's going bye bye. They're hiring the off all day. After nearly 30 minutes into the interview, detectives still had not questioned Lewis specifically about Linnell's murder. So they decided to confront him directly regarding Linnell's death. Your girlfriend was very badly hurt the other day. Did you wear this? When? Yesterday. How? Uh, so much hotter. Oh my God. Who's still here? Where she is right now? She's at the coroner's office, sir. She did not survive her wound. What is it? Really? Oh. Who's still here? So much hotter. I'm sorry? So much hotter. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god. That's we, not why you we understand that that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. That's not me. Why did you do that? Oh my god. It wasn't you who could have done it. I don't know. Despite Lewis's pleas for detectives to find the murderer and his insistence on his innocence, The mounting evidence pointed in a contrary direction, leading detectives to believe that the responsible party was in fact sitting right in front of them. As the interview drew to a close, the evidence and inconsistencies in his statements led detectives to arrest Louis Bonaire on suspicion of murder. However, despite a strong belief that they had apprehended the right suspect Detectives understood that the case was not yet conclusive. To solidify a murder conviction, they recognized the necessity for gathering additional evidence. So detectives turned to Linnell's family for more clues. While Lewis was being interrogated, Linnell's mother, Bobby, and her brother had set off for the police station. Once there, they were directed to an interview room. When detectives asked about Lewis's whereabouts, Bobby recounted to the detectives that Lewis had arrived at her home that day between 6 and 6.15 p.m., a detail anchored by their watching family feud. Then detectives decided to probe into the dynamics of Linnell and Lewis's relationship. Bobby replied, shedding more light on Lewis's intense jealousy. She recounted a particularly alarming incident from two months earlier in April. Detectives pieced together that this was notably around the same period when Lewis caught Ike and Linnell on a phone conversation, and the police were called. Bobby said that things escalated to the point where Lewis attempted to run Linnell off the road. According to Bobby, Linnell was terrified, screaming during the ordeal. She said that Linnell had told Lewis she intended to leave him, and upon attempting to drive away, Lewis chased her in his truck, aggressively colliding with her car, resulting in a broken window and damages to her car door. Adding to the narrative, Linnell's brother mentioned he observed Lewis looking up flight options and conducting bank transactions online, which raised suspicions that Lewis, originally from Haiti, might have been plotting his escape. At this point in the investigation, Lewis has vehemently denied any involvement in the murder. 
asserting that the detectives had apprehended the wrong person. However, his demeanor and the circumstantial evidence gathered only served to heighten the suspicions against him. The scratch on his cheek, which he attributed to Linnell's jealousy over a Facebook conversation with another woman, contradicted the known dynamics of their relationship. According to the evidence collected, it was Lewis who was widely recognized as the jealous partner, and his emotional reaction to the news of Linnell's death raised further doubts among the detectives. Though Lewis appeared to cry, the absence of actual tears led detectives to speculate that his grief might be insincere. Lewis's insistence that his relationship with Linnell was untroubled did not align with the accounts from those close to the couple and undermined his credibility. Additionally, Linnell's brother's statements about Lewis searching for flights to Miami and engaging in suspicious online banking activities flagged potential motives for fleeing, compounding the suspicions surrounding him. Each piece of evidence, viewed in isolation, might be explainable, but together they wove a narrative that pointed unmistakably toward Lewis as the prime suspect. However, one crucial factor in Lewis's favor was Bobby's verification of his presence at her home in LA around 6.15 p.m., effectively placing him over 60 miles from the crime scene at the time the murder occurred. This discrepancy raised a critical question for detectives. Could it be possible that Lewis had the assistance of an accomplice? So detectives returned to the crime scene, seeking clarity. Once detectives arrived, inside the garage, they uncovered critical evidence, bloodied black latex gloves, and a plastic container marked by a bloody fingerprint. Linnell's car had further unsettling clues. Cleaning supplies and a pillow in the trunk bore a bullet hole, surrounded by stippling, suggesting it was used to muffle the gunshot. Additionally, a large area rug crammed in the back seat had hair-weaving needles in it and displayed a bloody footprint. Although the garage contained significant evidence, detectives theorized that the murder took place elsewhere within the house. Their growing suspicion drew them back inside to the very spot in the family room where they had earlier noticed an empty space on the carpet. This space precisely matched the dimensions of the rug found in Linnell's car. To uncover more, a luminol test was conducted. To their surprise, a once invisible bloody trail originating in the family room illuminated. This grim pathway stretched across various rooms, outlining a horrifying journey that ended in the garage. It became clear that Linnell had been dragged from that very spot across the area rug, then across the carpet in the family room, to the kitchen, then to the hallway, across the laundry room, and finally into the garage. A solitary empty shell casing found in the family room also added to the grim scene. Detectives gathered the evidence to be sent for analysis. They were confident the results would unequivocally lead back to Lewis as the perpetrator piecing together the sequence of events that led to Linnell's tragic demise. As they awaited the forensic results, detectives revisited Lewis's narrative of his whereabouts on the day of the murder. Firmly, he maintained his innocence, claiming it was impossible for him to have been involved since he wasn't even home that day. According to Lewis, he had traveled over 65 miles to South Central Los Angeles to purchase auto parts for his truck. Now shifting focus to Lewis's truck in search of incriminating evidence, detectives were instead met with a surprising find. Inside the vehicle, they discovered several receipts from two downtown LA auto stores, all time stamped around the time Linnell was believed to have been murdered. At first glance, these receipts appeared to support Lewis's alibi, potentially exonerating him. However, the detectives remained skeptical of their authenticity and whether they indeed belonged to Lewis. Determined to uncover the truth, the detectives decided to visit the auto parts stores themselves, hoping to validate the receipts 
and determine whether Lewis's alibi held any weight. This next step was central in either solidifying his involvement in the crime or pointing the investigation in a new direction. Upon reaching the auto parts stores, detectives immediately requested to view the security footage. To their surprise, they indeed spotted Lewis in the video. Captured at 2.50 p.m., he entered the Los Angeles auto parts store, accompanied by a mechanic. They were seen purchasing auto parts. Subsequently, Lewis was also recorded at an auto zone in the vicinity. And remarkably, less than an hour later, at 5.36 p.m., he returned to the first auto parts store, this time alone, to make additional purchases. This evidence significantly altered the course of the investigation, compelling detectives to reconsider Lewis's possible presence in Palmdale during the afternoon of the murder. However, the question of whether Lewis might have coordinated with an accomplice remained unanswered. In pursuit of this theory, detectives drafted a search warrant for Lewis's phone records, a process known for its lengthy approval times, often extending to days or weeks. As the wait for the warrant's approval stretched on, Lewis found himself confined to a jail cell, weeks passing without resolution. The anticipation of what the phone records might reveal held the potential to either implicate him further or shed new light on the case. With the arrival of Lewis's phone records finally here, detectives were able to construct a detailed timeline of his whereabouts. The records indicated that Lewis departed from his residence just before 12.38 p.m. with his phone's location pings corroborating his movement away from home at that exact time. A subsequent ping at 12.44 p.m. in southwest Palmdale confirmed him driving out of Palmdale towards Los Angeles. The cell phone records were pivotal, especially noting the call from Linnell to Lewis at 2.30 p.m. on the day she was murdered. This call, occurring as Lewis drove towards LA, matched with cell tower data capturing his phone's signal along the freeway connecting Palmdale to downtown Los Angeles, squarely within the murder's estimated time. This detail, alongside the video evidence of Lewis shopping at the auto parts store and Bobby Barsock's verification of his 6 p.m. arrival at her house, unequivocally supported the theory that Lewis had not gone back to Palmdale that afternoon. So detectives concluded that Lewis could not have been Linnell's killer, prompting a dramatic shift in their investigation direction. The 2.30 p.m. call marked the last known contact with Linnell, establishing her alive at that moment. With Lewis confirmed to be 65 miles away by 2.50 p.m., the evidence compellingly cleared him of being Linnell's murderer, steering the inquiry towards new leads. After enduring more than a month behind bars, Lewis was finally released from jail. The detectives braced themselves, anticipating a cold reception and perhaps even a lawsuit from a man they had accused of the ultimate betrayal, murdering the woman he loved. But to their astonishment, the response they received from Lewis upon his release was nothing like they had anticipated. With tears streaming down his face, Lewis approached the detectives, embracing them in a heartfelt hug before shaking their hands. His gratitude for his release was palpable. He expressed a profound appreciation that starkly contrasted the outcome he feared based on his experience in Haiti. In his homeland, he explained, an arrest by police often meant being locked away indefinitely with little hope for justice or release. He had braced himself for a similar fate in America. The detectives offered Lewis an apology, clarifying that the absence of conclusive evidence against him necessitated his release. Despite the previous 911 call to his house, and narratives from Linnell's friends and her loved ones painting him as a man prone to jealousy. Lewis insisted that wasn't who he was. Now free, he was left to mourn Linnell's tragic passing 
and grapple with the unanswered questions surrounding her brutal murder. This new information left detectives to wonder who could be responsible for such a heinous act. Despite Louis Barnier's release from jail, the investigation into Linnell's murder remained active, with detectives not entirely convinced of his non-involvement. They speculated whether Lewis, once their primary suspect, could inadvertently guide them to another suspect, possibly an accomplice who had remained undetected. To test this theory, they discreetly placed an electronic tracker on his truck, monitoring his movements in hopes that his actions might reveal a connection to the true perpetrator. As the investigation's focus shifted away from Lewis, detectives redirected their attention to Ike, the other man entangled in this complex narrative. They reached out to Ike, probing his relationship with Linnell and Lewis and scrutinizing his whereabouts at the time of Linnell's murder. Ike, however, presented a solid alibi he was at the University of California at Davis in Sacramento for a job interview during the critical period. Determined to verify this claim, detectives contacted the interviewer and upon confirmation, Ike was officially cleared as a suspect. His concern for Linnell appeared sincere. He told detectives that he was the person who called 911 back in April. He recounted his decision to call 911 after Lewis discovered Linnell secretly communicating with him. Ike said that his fear that Lewis might harm Linnell prompted his emergency call. He said he was genuinely worried for her safety. And as it would turn out, Bobby had also corroborated Ike's caring nature. She shared with the detectives text messages he sent her on the day of the murder before anyone knew what had happened. At 7.27 p.m., Ike texted Bobby, expressing his concern for Linnell's safety. He sensed her fear of Lewis's potential actions. Then he sent a follow-up text at 7.28 p.m. pleading with Bobby to ensure Linnell's safety regardless of her relationship choices. Unknown to Ike, at the time of sending these messages, Linnell had already been killed. For detectives, Ike's interactions and concern for Linnell painted a picture of a love triangle they initially suspected could have driven Lewis to murder. Ike's genuine fear and efforts to protect Linnell, combined with his solid alibi, shifted the narrative away from a simple story of jealous rage to a more complicated web of relationships and motives yet to be fully unraveled. Some time had passed since placing the tracker on Lewis's truck and detectives have scrutinized Lewis's every move. However, they observed nothing incriminating. His behavior did not raise any red flags, nor did it hint at any hidden guilt or association with an accomplice. This surveillance ultimately reinforced two important points for the investigative team. Firstly, that Lewis was not responsible for Linnell's death, and secondly, that the real murderer was still at large prompting a renewed urgency in their search for Linnell's killer. Faced with a dead end, detectives revisited their initial witness, Lorene, Linnell's friend, for any overlooked details or inconsistencies that might shed new light on the case. Upon closer examination of Lorene's earlier statements, detectives found peculiar aspects that prompted further scrutiny. Lorene had mentioned leaving Linnell's house at 1.25 p.m. to head to a nearby park, citing a heated argument between Lewis and Linnell as her reason for leaving. Considering the time of year and the location's desert climate, detectives estimated the temperatures could have soared into the 90s. Lorene claimed to have returned to Linnell's residence around 6 p.m., which meant she would have spent approximately five hours at a park enduring intense heat to watch children play, none of whom she knew. Detectives found Lorene's explanation for spending such a lengthy period at the park under these conditions to be odd and questionable. Further arousing their suspicion was a chance encounter the morning after the murder. Lorene and Linnell's mother, Bobby, bumped into each other in the hallway at the sheriff's station. Lorene approached Bobby and hugged her. However, after Lorene was escorted down the hallway, 
Bobby asked detectives, who is that woman? Detectives replied, that's your daughter's best friend. They've known each other since high school. Bobby then shockingly said, I don't know her. I've never seen her before. Bobby had no idea who Lorene was, and detectives found it strange for someone who claimed a lifelong friendship with Linnell. Bobby's admission that she had never seen Lorene before struck everyone as highly alarming. This revelation raised significant doubts about Lorene's credibility and her purported close relationship with Linnell. For someone who professed to be Linnell's lifelong friend, the fact that Linnell's own family was unaware of her existence cast a shadow of suspicion over her, compelling detectives to consider new angles in their investigation. Further investigation into Lorene's actions and statements unearthed additional disturbing details. On the night she appeared at the sheriff's office, visibly distressed and covered in blood, deputies discovered two bullets in her purse. Lorene's explanations for the presence of bullets in her bag were inconsistent and unconvincing, so detectives checked the state's firearm registry for any weapons registered to Lorene, but found no evidence to suggest she owned a gun. Now more than a month after the murder, they brought Lorene back in and began to question the story she told them and whether she was really involved. But did you kill your friend? I did not kill my friend. I had no reason to kill my friend. I love my friend. In an effort to further their investigation, detectives invited Lorene to undergo a polygraph test. While aware that the results of such tests are not permissible in court within California, law enforcement officials often employ them as investigative tools. The tests can indicate whether a suspect's statements warrant further scrutiny or if investigative strategies should be adjusted. Lorene initially agreed to the polygraph, but repeatedly evaded the actual appointment at the police station. This evasion raised red flags for the detectives, prompting them to delve deeper into her online activities. They discovered that Lorene had been researching techniques on how to deceive a polygraph test, further casting doubt on her innocence. This discovery painted Lorene in an increasingly suspicious light. Detectives began to question the authenticity of her interactions with Linnell, speculating whether Lorene's offer to style Linnell's hair was a calculated move to gain proximity to her, possibly with ulterior motives. Lorene's actions and her attempts to manipulate the investigation process only served to deepen the suspicions surrounding her involvement in the crime. Approximately one week following their initial probe into Lorene's background, detectives decided to run her name through the firearms registry once more, leading to a significant breakthrough. This time, they discovered a match, indicating that Lorene owned a firearm identical to the one used in Linnell's murder. Linnell had been fatally shot with a 9mm bullet, and it was revealed that Lorene had purchased a 9mm Smith & Wesson semi-automatic pistol on February 18, 2010, merely four months prior to the crime. This newfound information linked Lorene directly to the murder weapon, substantially heightening her status as a suspect in the case. However, detectives were confronted with a critical unanswered question. What could Lorene's motive possibly be? Four months into the investigation, a critical breakthrough emerged from Lorene's cell phone records, revealing a web of deception. Lorene had been lying to detectives the entire time Contrary to her initial claims, Lorene and Linnell's friendship was not a decade-long friendship, but a connection that had formed mere weeks before the murder. Their relationship traced back to Craigslist, where Lorene had placed an ad in the personal section, Women Seeking Women, which Linnell responded to. This led to a rapid development of a friendship that escalated into a romantic and sexual relationship unbeknownst to Lewis. In addition to having two boyfriends, Linnell was also interested in women. Further scrutiny of Linnell's phone records revealed a fleeting connection with Lorene, spanning merely a month. Their brief romantic involvement came to an abrupt end when Linnell chose to terminate the relationship, sending Lorene a breakup message just five days prior to her tragic death. In her message, 
Linnell expressed a desire to recalibrate their relationship back to a platonic level, citing her growing commitment to her boyfriend as the reason for discontinuing their sexual relationship. She emphasized the value she found in their friendship and her wish to maintain it, stating, I'm getting quite serious with my boyfriend and I don't want anything sexual with you anymore. I enjoy your friendship and would like to keep it that way. Lorene's response to Linnell's decision appeared understanding and accommodating. She echoed the sentiment of valuing their friendship, replying, I understand. I'm just seeking friendship as well. I think you're a cool person to hang out with. Detectives concluded that the breakup text Linnell sent to Lorene was the catalyst for a tragic turn of events, leading Lorene to murder the woman who had ended their romantic relationship. It was Lorene not Lewis, who was the perpetrator behind the heinous act that the investigation was trying to solve. This insight highlighted the deceptions in Lorene's account. The detectives understood that Lewis had not been present at the house the day of the murders, debunking Lorene's narrative of an argument between him and Linnell that purportedly led her to leaving them to cool off while she was at the park. The story Lorene crafted was designed to mislead the investigation steering suspicion away from herself and towards Lewis, all while concealing her true motive and involvement in Linnell's murder. As the investigation continued, detectives grappled with the realization that if Lorene had fabricated her account of her relationship with Linnell, there could be more layers of deceit yet to uncover. Their suspicions proved correct. When they finally had enough to arrest Lorene, police surveilled her home over several days and then came to discover that Lorene had vanished. The search for Lorene stretched on for months until a critical break came following a broadcast of her story on America's Most Wanted during Christmas weekend in 2011. A viewer's tip led authorities to Belize, where Lorene had been hiding out in Punta Gorda under the alias Crystal, notably Linnell's middle name. The FBI, in collaboration with Belizean law enforcement, apprehended Lorene in a strategic operation. She was extradited back to the United States, arriving in handcuffs on July 25, 2012. Detectives wondered if Lorene Austin was lying about a relationship with Linnell Barsock, what more could she be lying about? Investigations into Lorene's activities during her brief relationship with Linnell revealed a startling pattern of identity appropriation. Lorene not only assumed Linnell's middle name as her alias while on the run, but also adopted facets of Linnell's life as her own while actively dating Linnell. She maintained an active dating profile during that time, engaging with three other women through Craigslist message boards simultaneously and presenting herself in a manner eerily similar to Linnell. Lorene would arrive at the homes of other women driving Linnell's blue BMW, claiming to be a nurse residing in an upscale house, details that mirrored Linnell's life rather than her own. This behavior suggested a deeper psychological motive, as Lorene appeared to be co-opting Linnell's identity and lifestyle for herself, blurring the lines between her persona and that of the woman she was accused of murdering. As the investigation continued, one of the women Lorene had connected with online provided a telling observation, noting how Lorene's admiration for Linnell bordered on idolization. It wasn't just simple admiration. Lorene seemed to worship Linnell, aspiring to embody her very essence. Lorene's personal life was entangled in financial turmoil, marked by mounting debt, relentless collections, all while residing at home with her mother. This wasn't a case of identity theft driven by financial gain, but a profound desire to assume Linnell's persona. Lorene's actions suggested an intense longing, not just to be with Linnell, but to become her. The Chain of Events At 9.34 a.m., Lorene texted Linnell with, Good morning, are you up? Before heading over to Linnell's place to finish her hair weave. She arrived at around 10 a.m. While braiding Linnell's hair, the topic of a secret cell phone emerged. Linnell mentioned she couldn't locate it. Then Lewis left for Lorene's boyfriend's house in LA at 10.30 a.m., planning to fix his truck. Discovering ongoing communication between Linnell and Ike on the phone 
Lewis returned to confront Linnell at approximately 11.30 a.m. During the confrontation, Linnell managed to take the phone from Lewis. Subsequently, Linnell and Lorene left the house, heading to a beauty supply store, and then to get lunch. At 12.05 p.m., security footage from the store captured Linnell's last appearance. She exited the store at 12.17 p.m. after a 12-minute visit. Lewis, having followed them, continued the argument at the store, but eventually Linnell returned the phone to him, and he went back home. Linnell and Loreen, after stopping for lunch, returned home at 12.30 p.m. Lewis left the house again at 12.38 p.m., with his phone pinging along the highway, indicating no further altercation at the home after their return. Lewis spent a mere eight minutes at the house with Loreen and Linnell before departing for Los Angeles the second time, leaving Linnell solely in Lorene's company. Contrary to her claims that she went to the park, Lorene stayed behind, spending the entire time alone with Linnell. At 2.30 p.m., Linnell spoke with Lewis on the phone. This was the last time anyone would speak with Linnell. Just before 4 p.m., Bobby's attempts to contact Linnell went unanswered. It was here. During this window, detectives determined was the time when Lorene, under the guise of continuing her hair, coldly executed Linnell with a shot to the back of the head, using a pillow to muffle the sound. Linnell never saw it coming. Following her murder, Lorene dragged her body across the house to the garage, masking her face with a plastic bag. She struggled to load Linnell's body into the trunk of the car alongside the rug pillow, cleaning supplies, and trash, using a tire as a makeshift ramp. As she attempted to clean up, at 4.44 p.m., Lorraine received a call from her boyfriend telling her that Lewis was on his way home. Running out of time and unable to proceed with her original plan to dispose of Linnell's body, Lorraine hastily concocted a plan to frame Lewis. She forged a breakup note in Linnell's handwriting and leaving the scene as it was, rushed into the sheriff's station, feigning a chase to implicate Lewis. Detectives determined that Lorene's plan to implicate Lewis in the crime was not the original plan. Her initial scheme involved disposing of Linnell's body in the desert, a common dumping ground for perpetrators. However, her inability to physically move Linnell's body into the trunk and fear of running out of time forced her to quickly devise an alternative strategy, framing Lewis for the murder. The original plan shifted at 4.44 p.m. when Lorene received a call from her boyfriend in L.A., informing her that Lewis was en route home. Caught off guard and unable to complete her cleanup, Lorene hastily initiated her backup plan. In a state of panic, she drove to the sheriff's station, fabricating a story to implicate Lewis as the murderer, unaware that Lewis had no intention of returning to the house that day. Lorene Austin's trial for the murder of Linnell Barsock commenced in August 2015, more than five years after the tragic incident. Spanning 21 days, the trial featured compelling testimony from a handwriting expert who confirmed the incriminating letter found at the crime scene was penned by Lorene. This revelation supported the prosecution's claim that Lorene had strategically placed the letter in the house as part of her elaborate scheme to frame Lewis before she made her calculated visit to the sheriff's office. The medical examiner testified that Linnell's cause of death was the result of being shot in the back of the head noting that the bullet entered Linnell's head at a downward angle. Prosecutors theorized that Lorraine's obsession with Linnell extended far beyond mere admiration, leading her to adopt Linnell's persona. This fixation, coupled with intense jealousy and resentment over Linnell ending their romantic relationship, was the motive behind Linnell's murder. The case against Lorraine was further solidified by the accumulation of forensic evidence directly linking her to the crime. Her DNA was identified on the black latex gloves found at the scene. Her bloody fingerprint was discovered on the plastic container, and her footprint was detected on the blood-stained rug. Additionally, the two live rounds found in Lorene's purse 
bore identical extraction marks to the spent casing found at the scene, indicating that all three bullets had been loaded in the murder weapon alongside each other. The gun, however, was never found. Despite the defense's efforts to redirect suspicion toward Lewis, the jury was unconvinced by their arguments. On August 13, 2015, Marine was convicted of first-degree murder. She was later sentenced to two consecutive terms of 25 years to life in prison, setting her minimum time served before eligibility for parole at 50 years. She received 25 years for the murder and 25 years for the firearm used during the commission of the murder. Lorene will be eligible for parole in the year 2042. Following the conviction, Lorene's defense team swiftly filed an appeal seeking to overturn the verdict. However, their efforts were met with disappointment when a state appeals court panel affirmed the conviction on November 10, 2017, upholding justice served for Linnell Barsock. Learning that the woman who had offered her an embrace in the hallway at the sheriff's station was in fact her daughter's killer left Linnell's mother in a state of profound shock. This revelation has inflicted a lasting scar, one that continues to haunt her to this day. Lewis has turned a new page in his life. He is now happily married and the proud father of a son. Reflecting on his journey from facing a potential life sentence to finding personal fulfillment, he acknowledges the vital support he received. Lewis credits his resilience and newfound happiness to the unwavering support of his wife, numerous siblings, and close circle of friends who stood by him through his darkest times. Linnell's good friend Marcel has honored her memory in a deeply meaningful way by naming his firstborn daughter after her. He intends to share with his daughter the story of her namesake, describing Linnell as an extraordinary woman who dedicated herself to assisting others, exemplified hard work, championed financial independence, and believed in the potential of people to become the best versions of themselves. Marcel hopes that his daughter will embody these admirable qualities inspired by Linnell's legacy to make a positive impact in the world. What do you think about this case? Within just a few weeks of meeting Linnell, Lorene began taking on her persona. What do you think motivates a person to co-opt another's persona the way she did? Do you think Lorene would have killed again? What about her sentence? Do you think Lorene's sentence was appropriate? Let's continue the conversation down in the comments section below. As always, I'll meet you there. In these stories, there are no perfect victims or people, only imperfect individuals playing various life roles. Like us, these victims have been caring friends, devoted siblings, loving parents, and supportive partners. If we can acknowledge that these roles show their capacity for love and dedication, then we can acknowledge that they have touched lives in ways that merit gratitude. This is why I extend my thanks to the victims for being beacons of love and light despite their flaws. So thank you, Linnell, for being an example of love and light. May you rest in eternal peace.